Good morning. It is the third Sunday after Epiphany, and we welcome you wherever you are to the Sunday worship of St. George's Anglican Church in London, Ontario. Lord, open our lips, and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, you have called us together as your people. You have called us your friends and invited us to follow you. And so your church has grown from scattered homes in ancient times to a worldwide community, embracing men and women, old and young, from many nations and cultures. In our worship today, inspire us to wonder at the miracle of your church. Help us see the privilege we share to be part of your people across the ages and across the continents. It is your love that keeps drawing us to you and to each other. And so we offer our wonder and praise with the millions of people around the world who also gather in your name this day. But first, let us remember the things we have done, the words we have spoken, the thoughts we have had, which got in the way of the good you would have us do and the love you would have us live out in our day-to-day -day encounters. Together we say, God of all the ages, we gather in worship week by week, hoping to encounter your presence. But we confess it's not easy to hear your voice, especially in these challenging times. Sometimes we get distracted by what's happening around us. Sometimes we get confused by conflicting views of what you expect from us. Sometimes we feel challenged and resist a new word from you. We confess it is hard to turn our lives around when we think we already know where we're going. Forgive our failures and enable us to get it right for the sake of all your children. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness and keep you in eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And now the collect for the third Sunday after Epiphany. Lord Jesus Christ, with those you have called by the lakeside, may we follow you, proclaiming the reign of God and sharing your mission to bring good news to all. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The first reading is from the book of Jonah. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Get up, go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah set out and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly large city, a three days walk across. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's walk, and he cried out, Forty days more and Nineveh will be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast, and everyone, great and small, put on sackcloth. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us now say together the Song of Mary. 
My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. My My spirit spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, for for he has looked with favor on his lowly servant. From From this day, all generations will call me blessed. The Almighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. He has mercy on those who fear him in every generation. He has has shown shown the strength of his arm. arm. He He has has scattered the proud in their conceit. He He has cast down the mighty from their thrones and has lifted up the lowly. He He has has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he he has has sent away empty. empty. He He has has come come to the help of his servant Israel for he he has remembered his promise of mercy the promise he made to our fathers, to Abraham and his children forever. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Reading from the Gospel according to Mark. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God and saying, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And he went a little farther. He saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat mending the nets. And immediately he called them. And they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him gospel of Christ. I speak to you in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. I remember as if it were yesterday 60 years ago in this room, singing my lungs out to the song, I will make you fishers of men. Well, we sang with great enthusiasm in part because it was a simple song, but also it was the first action song I can ever remember singing. And we were fishing and jerking in two-footed fish for Jesus. Um, didn't really understand what the song meant. Uh, Never occurred to us back then that it was politically incorrect because whoever heard of that term? And it never occurred to us back then that as Anglicans, I mean, the Church of England, uh, we don't fish for people. We leave that to other folks. We just build the boat and if people want to get caught, we let them jump in on their own. Uh, And if we're really progressive, then we get a fancy sign to put by the boat to help attract the fish and let them know it's a pretty good boat to jump into. Uh, But fishing for people, no, we, we leave that to other denominations. The thing about this reading, however, is that I, I don't think it has anything to do anything to do with growing the church or reeling in another two-footed fish for Jesus. I don't think it's about that at all. I think if we put it in context, what we find is that this is a really powerful reading and it's an important reading for us today. First, we have to remember, remember that at the time, at the time that Jesus was doing his ministry, And at the time that the Gospel of Mark was written, 
Remember that Caesar had some other titles. We've talked about this before. He wasn't just called Caesar. He was also called Lord, ruler, ruler of the world. He was called the Prince of Peace because of the Pax Romana, the Peace of Rome, which was a peace that was won through bloody battles and maintained through excessive taxes. And he was also called the Son of God. The other thing we remember is that the term gospel, euangelion, good news, was a term that was used by the empire before it was ever used by the Christian church. Euangelion, gospel, was the term that was used whenever tremendous successes were being celebrated in the empire or when Caesar was issuing decrees and make no mistake about it, when euangelion was proclaimed, when gospel was proclaimed, it was expected that people would respond. So let's look at the very, very first, first verse in Mark's gospel. The beginning of the good news, the euangelion, the gospel of Jesus Christ, Jesus, the Messiah, Jesus, the King, the Son of God. Be very clear. What Mark is saying in the first sentence of his gospel is this is God's world, not Caesar's. And lest we missed it, we go down just a few verses to where Jesus was baptized by John in the wilderness. And at his baptism, we hear the words spoken by God. You are my son. My beloved, with you I am well pleased. Let, let's be clear what this is about. The statement is being made in the gospel that Jesus is the Son of God, not Caesar. Jesus is Lord, not Caesar. This is God's world, not Caesar's. And so today, as Jesus' ministry begins after John has been arrested, we hear these words, that Jesus came to Galilee. He didn't start out in Jerusalem in the very center of the military and political complex. He started in the northern part of the kingdom in Galilee. And he arrived in Galilee and listened to these words, proclaiming the good news, euangelion, the gospel of God. And, and, and you have to know that in the same way that when the euangelion, the gospel of Caesar was being proclaimed in the empire, in the same way that there was a response expected, the same holds true here. Jesus didn't go into Galilee and say, listen, let me float a few ideas by you to see how you feel about it. No, he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God. And, and this is what he said. He said, the time is fulfilled. Now there are two Greek words for time. There's chronos, which is the time of day. And there's kairos, which is momentous time. It's, it's world changing time. It's God's time. Jesus said the time, the kairos is fulfilled. God's time has been fulfilled. God's kingdom is near. God's kingdom is breaking in. And then he said, repent, repent and believe the good news. And as he says to them, repent, he's, he's not telling the people, listen, you need to confess all of the bad things that you've ever done and, and, and tell God that you're sorry for it. What he's doing by saying repent is you need to reorder your lives. You need to leave behind you ambitions and agendas that will only cause more pain and suffering. You need to leave behind you ambitions and agendas that get in the way of God's kingdom 
and believe, trust the good news, trust the euangelion, trust the gospel, that the kingdom is breaking in. Those are powerful words, powerful words. And then he begins to go about the business of calling his disciples. And he goes by the lakeside. And for us, I think, to understand what happens next in this gospel, we have to know a little bit about the fishing industry in Jesus' day. Uh, because fishing in Jesus' day was highly regulated by Rome. The vast majority of the fish that was caught were salted and shipped off around the empire to feed, to feed the empire. And not only that, before you could go out to fish, you had to have a fishing lease. No lease, your boat stayed ashore. After the fish were caught, you paid taxes on the fish you had caught and before you could transport them anywhere, you had to pay tariffs or tolls for transporting your catch. Rome used the fishing industry in Israel as part of the means of funding the empire, part of how they funded the war machine, and, and part of the taxes went to help support Rome's friends, specifically Herod Antipas and his family. It supported the might of Rome and the ongoing building of cities like Caesarea Maritima and Tiberias, two cities dedicated to show what loyal servants the Herods were to the power of Rome. So it is small wonder, small wonder that when Jesus came on the scene saying the kingdom of God is near, the time has come when the kingdom is breaking in so that the poor and the oppressed are going to have their lives changed. It is hardly surprising that the first people who got on board were fishermen. Now, let's look just a little bit at the business about fishing for people. And I know that there are some folks who find that phrase a little annoying. But this is kind of the background. In Jeremiah chapter 16, Verses 16 and 17, listen to this. Jeremiah has, through, through Jeremiah's lips, God is saying, I am now sending for many fishermen, says the Lord, and they shall catch them. And afterward, I will send for many hunters and they shall hunt them from every mountain and every hill and out of the clefts of the rocks for my eyes are on all of their ways. They are not hidden from my presence, nor is their iniquity concealed from my sight. Or in Amos chapter four, listen to this. Hear this word, you cows of Bashan who are on Mount Samaria, you who oppress the poor, who crush the needy, who say to their husbands, bring something to drink, the Lord God has sworn by his holiness that the time is surely coming upon you when they shall take you away with hooks, even the last of you with fish hooks. The people of Jesus' day would understand that when Jesus talked about making people fishers of men, he was using a metaphor from the scriptures of the people of Israel that was about judgment on the rich and the oppressors. It was about restoring justice 
to the poor and to the oppressed. When Jesus said to them, follow me, he was saying to them, get behind my movement. The kingdom train has pulled into the station. Get on board. Do not let it leave without you. The notion of being fishers of men was not about building a church. Jesus hadn't even begun to imagine a church. It wasn't about evangelism. It was about changing the world. It was about transforming the world. It was about building a kingdom movement that would challenge all the forces of darkness and evil, challenge all those things which oppress human life. Follow me and I will make you fish for people. But, but there's a bit more to it than that. In Jesus' day, the sea, the sea was seen as a dark and evil place. It was a place of chaos, a place where people believed Leviathan sea monsters were. And so when, when you fished, you were bringing sustenance, you were bringing your food out of the darkness of the sea into the light of day. Listen, in, in Matthew's gospel, Matthew talks about this same moment in time and, and listen to what Matthew has to say. He said, now when Jesus heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew to Galilee. He left Nazareth and made his home in Capernaum by the sea in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali so that what had been spoken through the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Listen to this. Land of Zebulun, land of Naphtali, on the road by the sea, across the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. For those who sat in the region and the shadow of death, light has dawned. And from that time, Jesus began to proclaim, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. The light of God has come near. And, and then he went and called the disciples and said, follow me and I will make you fish for people. I think when we, when we look at it in terms of that cultural understanding of fishing, what we're hearing is not just an invitation to join the movement, not just an invitation that spoke of revolution, but an invitation to be part of a movement to take people out of the darkness of fear and despair and poverty and suffering and to move them from that darkness into the light of God's presence, to move them into a place where they can find hope and reason to live and to love. And that's good news. What we have in our gospel reading today is the beginning of Jesus putting together a movement that was going to change the world. A life-changing, world-changing, world-transforming movement. And that's exciting. Unfortunately, unfortunately, we took that life-changing, world-changing, world-transforming movement, and we turned it into an institution. Now, don't get me wrong. I love the church. I have given my entire adult life to serving it. And, and at our best, we make a difference. At our best, we make an impact at our best we can change lives. But all too often, the church gets more concerned about 
raising its brand than bringing in the kingdom. All too often, we become self-absorbed. Our energy goes into maintaining the buildings, maintaining the brand, maintaining the institution, and not doing the work of the kingdom. I believe after 46 years of ministry in the church, that the church has a valuable, valuable, critical place in the life of our world. But if we are going to fulfill the role that we are called to fulfill, then we have got to move from being an institution concerned about itself to being a movement concerned about transforming the world. We have to recapture what it is that Jesus created when he said to his disciples, the time is fulfilled. God's kairos, God's moment is at hand. Repent, leave behind your agendas, leave behind your ambitions, trust in the good news and follow me. It is time we need to do that. In the inauguration of President Biden this week, we heard from a young woman who was probably going to be the most quoted human being on the face of the earth this week. But Amanda Gordon said these, Borman said these words, there is always light if we are brave enough to see it, if we are brave enough to be it. Question, my friends, is will we be brave enough to see it? Will we be brave enough to be it? The answer to that question will define our future. The future of the church, the future for our children, the future of our world. The time is fulfilled. God's time is fulfilled. The kingdom of heaven has drawn near. And so repent. Leave behind ambitions. Leave behind agendas. Leave behind anything that gets in the way of the kingdom. And become part of God's movement to oppose evil and darkness and to bring God's children into the incredible light of God's presence, the light of love and peace and hope and joy. In Jesus' name, amen.
we affirm our faith in the words of the Shema. We say together, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first and the great commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Celebrating the coming of the one who brings the reign of God to all people, let us pray for the world God loves, the church God calls, and all people according to their needs, saying, Lord, in your mercy, and responding, hear our prayer. God, who speaks light into being, shine on us, shine in us, shine through us, shine brightly so that the world may experience your care. May we work with you as you bring your light and life into our reality. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. God, who speaks love into being, guide us into becoming the loving people you have called us to be. Help us to reach out to our neighbors, especially those who do not feel loved or welcomed or included. People of all races, colors, religions, and languages. We pray that the difference between us, which sadly seems so important to us, will not blunt our witness to Jesus and the healing and hope he offers. Teach us to value diversity in our discipleship and honor what unites us more than what divides us so that the world may see Jesus reflected in all our lives. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God who speaks life into being, increase our wonder at your good creation. May its awesomeness inspire us to care for the air, land, water, plants, animals, and insects. For the sake of our children, our children's children, and the future of all humanity. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. God, who speaks hope into being, send us as messengers of expectation. May we look for your presence in the hard places of life. May we see you in the darkness. God of all times and situations, we bear our hearts our heart's concerns for many around us, people we know and situations we care about, where suffering exerts its power and challenges seem overwhelming. Today we pray for all those whose work has changed without their choice because of COVID-19, for those struggling with little or no work whose businesses are in jeopardy who fear for what this year may hold. Assure them of their value to you and to us all. Give them courage and perseverance as the future unfolds, especially those we name before you now. Hear us in this time of silence as we open our hearts and their needs to you. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. God speaks health into being. Use our hands to bring healing to the sick, our presence to bring comfort to the isolated, our voices to bring your word of promise to the hopeless. We remember before you today people living face to face with illness and suffering, those struggling with disability made more complex these days. And those who know grief or anxiety, especially those cut off from comfort or support by months of pandemic isolation. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. God who shines in the darkness, 
bind up the brokenhearted, bring justice for the vulnerable, and send your spirit of healing and hope to embrace those who need you. Receive these prayers and the prayers of our hearts in the name of the one who is your light, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. And so, joining our voices to Jesus' followers around the world, we pray the words he taught us. Our Our Father Father in in heaven, heaven, hallowed be your name. Your Your kingdom kingdom come, come, your your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Now may God bless you with discomfort at easy answers, half-truths, and superficial relationships so that you may live deep within your heart. May God bless you with anger at injustice, oppression, and the exploitation of people so that you may work for justice and freedom and peace. May God bless you with tears to shed for those who suffer from pain, rejection, starvation, and war so that you may reach out your hand to comfort them and turn their pain into joy. May God bless you with enough foolishness to believe that you can make a difference in this world so that you can do what others claim cannot be done. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and those whom you love and pray for today, tomorrow, and forever. Amen.